God cares for you. God cares for you. Those four words are the focus of our conversation today. God cares for you. So I'd like to ask you to do a few things with those four words right now in your house, church. First of all, I'd like to ask you to personalize them. I'd like you to say to yourself, God cares for me. And I want you to take just a couple of minutes. I'll let the person that's uh, facilitating your house church this morning kind of dictate that timing but just God cares for me think about what that means to you maybe you want to focus on God that he's the giver of every good and perfect gift that he's the healer that he's the savior maybe you want to focus on what it means to care maybe you want to focus specifically on how he's cared for you over your lifetime so just think about it personalize it and think about it then secondly I'm going to ask you to go around your house church and say it out loud to everyone in the group and as you say it out loud, God cares for me, I want you to share with those who are with you today what that means to you right now, how it makes you feel. Use this as a time of prayer and thanks. Maybe you can even say, this is how I saw God care for me this past week. But here's what I know. There may be some of you who are listening to this right now who aren't sure that that's the truth. You're walking through something that is so hard and so painful, you're questioning whether or not God cares for you. And if that's you today, here's what I want to ask you to try to do, to try to muster everything that, was within, everything that is within you, all the faith that you have, and simply make that a statement of faith and make it out loud. God cares for me. And you don't have to say anything else. There won't be any judgment. There won't be anyone pushing you to share, well, what's troubling you? No one in your house church will pressure you. But if you are questioning whether or not God cares, or whether or not God is caring for you in a specific situation that you're walking through, I just want to ask you, would you just say those four words out loud and then just go on to the next person? After you've done that and everybody in the room has had a chance to speak, here's what I want to ask you to do then. I want everyone that's in your house church today to hear those words with their name attached to it. So in your house church, I'm just going to ask you to go around the room and just say the name of the person seated to your left and just add those four words. So in my house church, I might say, Autumn, God cares for you. I think it's so important that we don't just say it, but that we hear it on a repeated basis, that we hear our name specifically attached to that. So would you just go around the room and just say to those, just make sure everybody hears their name and hears that God cares for them. Then... Once you've done all of those things, spend some time in prayer. Just follow the Holy Spirit wherever He leads. Whoever's facilitating your house church will lead you through this time. And then when you're done, come back. And we're going to continue this conversation in 1 Peter chapter 5 and decide what to do when life gets hard. I've been praying and trusting God for weeks that the time you've just experienced in your house church was filled with great peace and maybe even a few tears as we come to realize this important truth and Peter shares it with us here in 1 Peter chapter 5 that God cares for each and every one of us. And it's so important to these people who are living as strangers in a world that is against them that they're facing all kinds of dangers that they understand at the very fundamental basic foundation God cares for them no matter what they're walking through. You see, from the very beginning of the church, Christians have been persecuted for their faith in Jesus. At first, we see in the scriptures, in the, in the book of Acts, that the Christians were persecuted by the Jewish religious authorities, men like Saul of Tarsus, who went out looking to round them up and kill them simply because they professed faith in Jesus. Later on, the Roman Empire would persecute Christians. From Nero in the first century to Diocletian in the first part of the fourth century, Christians were regularly martyred for proclaiming that Jesus was the Son of God. Throughout the Middle Ages, the followers of Jesus Christ were killed because they would not submit to the dogma of the land and they confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord and he was the only one they would follow. And today in countries all across the world we watch as we see brothers and sisters in Christ persecuted for their faith and killed because they proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he is the way of salvation. Peter wrote this letter during the rule of Nero and he wrote not only to a persecuted church, but to a church that was struggling with how to live out their faith, what to do when life got hard. And they were going through what they were going through when Peter wrote this letter was hard, but it was going to get worse. 
The difficulty many of us face today is not necessarily persecution, especially those of us in the U.S. Most of our struggles come from a failure to remain consistently under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The secret to an effective Christian life, what to do when life gets hard, is found in living in His strength, not our own, in living under His control and not under self-rule. We find it easy to serve our Lord when times are good and when it costs us nothing to hold on to our faith. But when there are times, but the times when we grow weary, when we feel defeated, when it seems that the circumstances of life will surely overwhelm us, it's in those moments that we have to choose between dealing with life in our own strength or remaining dependent on the Spirit of God and figuring out what to do with our faith when life gets hard. If you find yourself in a situation where life is hard and you're struggling with what to do, I want you to take heart today. God has a word of encouragement for you. It's found here in 1 Peter chapter 5. His desire is to use these difficult times to strengthen you, to perfect you, to establish you, to demonstrate for you how he wants to care for you. Did you forget? God cares for you. So as Peter wraps up this first letter, he draws our attention to six actions or commands. Maybe you'll count seven. And so if you can find them as you read together in your house church, 1 Peter chapter 5, find six or seven things that Peter commands these believers who are living in hard times to do. Discuss what God's Spirit shows you in this passage, and then you can come, we'll come back together and continue our conversation of, of what to do when life gets hard. There's going to be a timer on the screen. You can let that play, but if you're not done in your conversation in your house church, you just hit pause and you come back, and we'll look at these six or seven things of what to do when life gets hard. As we spend time in 1 Peter chapter 5, we are reminded that we have an enemy and that it's our enemy's goal to cause us to suffer and to live in fear. In this section of 1 Peter that you just read, 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter reminds the followers of Jesus that he's writing to of what to do when life gets hard. And he gives seven commands, imperatives, of how we're supposed to live when life gets hard. I'm gonna move through these quickly and maybe you wanna take note because this is what I want to be the discussion in your house church as we wrap up our time uh, together. So what do we do when life gets hard? Number one, in 1 Peter chapter 5, we find out in verse 6 that we need to be humble. Verse 6, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. The Greek verb here used for humble is in the passive voice. You're like, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that it could be translated this way. Be humbled. In this case, it's the hand of God that is humbling us. What we're being instructed to do is we're being instructed to allow God to humble us. To the first hearers, it was persecution that God used to humble them. To you and me, it could be the frustrations of everyday life. Rather than complaining about them, we have to learn to submit to the Lordship of Jesus. Only when we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand will He exalt us. God uses a variety of things to humble people. Sometimes, he uses people that I like to refer to as heavenly sandpaper. Those people that just rub you the wrong way every time and you've got to muster everything inside of you to give them some grace. Sometimes he uses tragedy. Sometimes he loses, uses loss. And even though God may not have sent the calamity or the loss your way, he wants to take it and he wants to use it for our good. Our problem is we often won't accept this humbling experience under the sovereign hand of God. We live under the delusion of self-rule. We complain, we struggle, we squirm, we grumble. But we need to allow God to humble us. And that means to remember that God is in control. Nothing will happen that He is not allowed. When He allows it, He has a purpose for it. And that purpose is always for our good. To humble ourselves means to accept all that happens to us without the resentment or without rebellion against God Himself. Humility means accepting God's rule instead of ours. It means accepting His rule when we don't understand. It means accepting His rule when He doesn't give us an explanation. The very word humility here in the Greek language means to make oneself low, to abase, to make small, or to weaken. And that is contrary to human nature to be made low. It goes against the grain of our pride and our sense of self-worth to allow anyone or anything to weaken us or make us small. But in the kingdom of God, things are different than in the empires of men. The verse immediately before this says that God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The rest of verse 6 says this. It says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you at the proper time. 
God will exalt those who have been humbled. But the reason we struggle with this is because with this is because of that phrase at the proper time. Because the proper time never seems to be in alignment with our time. It's never in alignment with our schedule. And as long as we're thinking we know the schedule and we know the timing when we should be exalted, it means we're still nursing and nurturing pride in our own life. And it's not until our pride is dead that God will ultimately exalt us. Humility means we lose our pride, but we gain God's favor. When we are humbled, when we are made low, when we are abased, when we come to our sense of, a sense of our own weakness, we will be forced to depend on Him. And that's the second thing. First of all, be humbled. Now look at verse 7. It says, number two, be dependent. Cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. God cares for you. While pride makes us self-reliant, humility positions us to recognize and accept our dependence on God. The Greek word for God, uh, to cast all your cares, the care is anxiety. Here it's used to express the burden that comes with anxious apprehension. Instead of fighting this, we're to turn it back over to the Lord because God is sovereign. If we are His, the only thing that comes into our lives are the things that He allows, so we ought to just give it right back to Him. Listen to Psalm 55, 22. It says this, Cast your burden on the Lord, and He will support you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. The interesting thing about this verse in Psalm 55 is that the word translated burden means what God has given you. It might be literally translated this, Throw upon the Lord whatever burden He has assigned to you, and He will sustain you as you bear it. He will not allow you to totter. While humility causes us to see our own weakness, dependence causes us to recognize and rely on God's strength. And within the context of what the Scripture is saying, we're being told that God often allows difficulties to come our way to teach us both about our own weakness and then about His supernatural strength. One of the problems with modern-day American versions of Christianity is that it's nothing more than a secular self-help philosophy draped in religious garb. Instead of preaching that we are to see ourselves as nothing and find all that we are in Christ Jesus, Many people preach a gospel that says God helps those who help themselves and nothing could be further from the truth of Scripture. Dependence on the Lord means that instead of struggling with our own cares, nursing our own anxieties, and complaining about all that God has allowed to come into our lives, we simply turn them back over to Him, accepting this truth. He will sustain us because He cares for us. Be humble. Be dependent. Third, verse 8, be alert. So what it says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Look at this description of why we need to be alert. We have an enemy. And here Peter refers to him as the devil. Notice this in verse 8. First of all, it says he's our enemy. He's a slanderer. He's an accuser. He's a liar. Jesus called him a thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He is our enemy. Do not forget that you have an enemy whose job description is to destroy you. Second, but secondly, it says that this enemy, this devil, is a prowler. What's that mean? It means he operates in stealth mode. If we saw him coming, covered in red, with horns and a pitchfork, we would run the other way, but that's not how he comes. He comes in stealth mode. Third, it says he's a lion. It means he's a vicious beast. He wants to rip you apart. This battle is real, and we need to understand his job is to destroy us. And the devil is, after all, believers in Jesus. Yes, that would include you if you've chosen to put your faith in Jesus Christ. So, stay alert. Instead of being anxious because we decide to depend on the Lord, we can mentally calm down. And because we know we have an enemy, we can be alert to the reality that our enemy wants to use every circumstance in our lives to destroy us. The imagery here is that of a hungry lion on the prowl, looking for someone to devour. The literal, literal meaning of this word devour means to consume or swallow up. Satan is an enemy of everyone who chooses to follow Jesus. He is the eternal, eternal enemy of our souls. Jesus said he came to steal, kill, and destroy. From the very beginning of time in the Garden of Eden, our enemy has sought to destroy all that God created to be good. Today he seeks to destroy you and me as we seek to live the Christian life. We must be alert to our enemy. In this letter, let me just very quickly share with you some of the things Peter reminds those who hear to be alert to, to some of the schemes, to some of the attacks of the danger, to, to, to the attacks of the enemy, to some of the stranger dangers. First of all, he says, be aware that the enemy is going to try to destroy you through hopelessness. 1 Peter, 3, 1 Peter 1, verse 13. Prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your gracious hope 
Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. The enemy tries to pr promote hopelessness, but we as followers are alert to that, and we put our hope in Jesus and his next coming. Then he says worldliness. He says we need to be alert. He says, verse, chapter 2, verse 11, Dear friends, I warn you, as strangers, as temporary res residents and foreigners, keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your souls. There is a competition. He's going to make the things of the world look attractive, and you're going to start pursuing those. Be alert that that's just a disguise. Thirdly, he's going to try to destroy us through lovelessness, to make us feel that we're not loved, to make us feel that we're not cared for. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Peter writes this, You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all of your heart. We need to be in community where we know that we're loved, where we know that we're cared for by God and by those he puts in our path. And then 1 Peter chapter 4, he says this, most, of, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. And then, one of the ways the enemy tries to destroy us is through pride. First Peter chapter 5, we've just looked at it. Dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you at the proper time. Fourth, here are two commands. Be vigilant and be tenacious. Verse 9, stand firm against him, strong in your faith. When we've humbled ourselves, when we've found our strength in God, when we've learned that the secret of dependence, when we've learned that secret of dependence and will remain on our guard against the devil, we can stand our ground. There is a direct relationship between a strong faith and, a, and the ability to live an overcoming life. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us to take up, take up the shield of faith and having put on the whole armor of God to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. James chapter 4 says this, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And here in 1 Peter chapter 5 we said, told to resist the devil, to stand firm in our faith. When our faith is strong, when our confidence is in God, and our confidence is unshaken, it is then and only then that we have turned the battle over to the Lord. As David stood before Goliath, found in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17, he said this, The battle is the Lord. In Exodus chapter 14, as Moses and his people stood between the Red Sea and the armies of Pharaoh approaching, Moses told the Israelites, the Lord will fight for you. You must be quiet. Throughout the scriptures, whenever God's people stood firm in their faith, these, they see God come through. Whether it's Daniel in the lion's den or Paul and Silas in the Philippian jail, when people put their trust in God, when they stand firm in their faith, God comes through. Resist the devil, stand firm in your faith, and watch God come through for you. Don't give up. Don't give in to discouragement. Don't give in to the devil. Don't give the devil a foothold. Stand firm in your faith. Be strong. Peter told us earlier in this letter to stand firm in our example to others, to stand firm in prayer, and to stand firm by the word of God. So when life is hard, be humble, be dependent, be alert, be tenacious, be vigilant. And now look at the verse, the next thing, verse the fifth thing, sixth thing. Uh, be prepared, verses 9 and 10. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. In His kindness, God called you to share in His eternal glory by means of Jesus Christ. Be prepared for the persecution that will come. It was going on, but it was just starting as Peter wrote this letter, and it was going to intensify. As Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote these words to the early church, persecution was spreading, and he didn't want them to be caught off guard. We're told in other places, Scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. In July of the year 64, Nero set fire in Rome, and it devastated the city. Needing a scapegoat, he placed the blame on Christians. The result was that Christians were beaten, tortured, and many were killed. Some were thrown into the arena where they were torn apart by wild beasts. Others were boiled in oil and cased in wax and burned at the stake like candles. For the better part of three centuries, Christians would be persecuted. Until in, th until in the year 313, the Roman, Roman Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan declaring religious freedom for all faith, including Christians. Perhaps there's no more pertinent message for the church in America to hear today than this one. Persecution, might, persecution will come, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. The culture is not going to change. The culture is not going to drift back towards God because we have an enemy intent on destroying 
everyone in his path until Jesus comes. But our hope is in the triumphant return of Jesus Christ to earth. Our hope is in the eternal life that he promises. This world is not our home. We are strangers. And in fact, we face dangers, but as pilgrims and strangers and sojourners, we will suffer here for a little while. That cannot be avoided, but our hope is in Jesus, what he came to do and what he will come again to do. But after we have suffered for a little while, now look at the last part of verse 10, be assured. That's the last thing I want you to see. Be assured. After you've suffered for a little while, he will restore, support, strengthen, and place you on a firm foundation. Here we have the promise that as God accomplishes his purpose in us, these are the things that he will do. Notice the words Paul uses here to describe God. The God of all grace. The God who shows unmerited favor towards us. He loves us. His purpose in allowing persecution and suffering is motivated by nothing other than his perfect love for us. He is the God of all grace. He will have mercy on us. As we stand firm, resisting the devil, God will do these four things. First, it says restore. It means to bring us to wholeness so that nothing is lacking. Complete us in every way. Then it says he will support. The idea here is that he makes us firm. Rather than being uncertain and weak, we will be resolute and determined in our faith. Then it says he will strengthen us. He will make use of these difficulties to make us stronger, to enable us to face anything that he allows to come our way. And then finally, it says he will place us on a firm foundation. The picture here painted in the scriptures is of a foundation that is not shaky, but settled and is firmly founded. Those are the things God will do, and that's what to do when life gets hard. What are you going through right now? Maybe life hasn't turned out the way you planned. Perhaps the cares and burdens of life seem more than you can bear. Don't fight it. Let God use these things to humble you, to cause you to be dependent on Him. Why? Because bottom line, He cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares on Him because He cares for you. I'm going to ask you now. That's a lot of information, but now it's time for some transformation. Would you gather back in your house church and would you think about those six or seven things but would you also, as you go to the Lord's table today, look at that bread and look at that cup and remember, he cares for you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you, to give you victory. What care do you have today that you need to take to him? Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. What do you do when life gets hard? Cast your cares on him and trust that he cares for you, almighty God. Would you move now in house churches? Would you allow conversations to honor you? Father, would you bring healing to deep hurt? Would you surround us at your table with an awareness of your care over us? Father, for those that are watching by themselves, listening by themselves, God, would you encourage them how much you care for them? Would you challenge them to just maybe send a text message to somebody to say, hey, God cares for you. Father, would you encourage them to get involved in a, in a house church where they can surround themselves with people that will remind them when life gets hard, God cares for you and we care for you too. Father, bless these discussions as we come to your table now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.